Audi makes some of the coolest cars on the planet. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about five in particular that depreciated a bunch and are great value for money in my opinion. Relatively expensive, under 35,000 pounds, but in terms of quality, performance, and all the rest of it, these are some insane Audis. So let's get straight into it. Hit the like button if you want to see more videos like this. Let me know in the comments down below what other brand you'd like to see me do this with instead. And subscribe as well if you're new without further ado, let's get straight into it. <laughs> I simply can't believe that the first generation Audi R8 has effectively refused to move in price since I started this YouTube channel around six years ago. Back then you could grab them for around or just under the 30k mark and today it's the same story with super ropey ones sitting at 25k but most starting at around £29,000 with our 35k limit getting you a 2008 model with around 50,000 miles on the clock. Considering you're getting a car that caused debate around whether or not it's a supercar for that kind of money, I had to get the R8 onto this list as a car that not only looks more exotic than everything else on this list, it actually is probably the one that's most close to becoming a classic, partially because it's the oldest car on the list, but also because the R8 has just finished production altogether, despite being such a well-loved nameplate. The first generation came with a 4.2 litre V8, producing 423 brake horsepower, taking it to 60 in 4.5 seconds, making it by far the slowest car on the list despite those looks, but it's worth mentioning that you can get it with the gated manual gearbox which is magnificent, beautiful and also not that conducive to 0-60 times. The origin of this car is quite interesting. Of course Audi were known for great success in motorsports both off-road and on track but in terms of their fast road cars they were mostly focused on making saloons, estates and coupes faster particularly with their quattro all-wheel drive. So when the TT came about in the 90s it was a big shift for the brand to suddenly be making a little sports car and it was that concept alongside the domination of sports car racing at Le Mans and VW's ownership of Lamborghini that made this car possible. The R8 takes a lot of its platform and features from the Gallardo because it meant VW could hedge against the Gallardo doing badly without spending a bunch of money on development for a new supercar. If you're buying one they can be pretty priced to maintain longer term and if you go for an early one check to see whether the front part of the frame got the strengthening it needed as these models often got cracked frames that would render them write-offs. Believe it or not, from an almost supercar, the next fastest car on the list is a hot hatch, or probably more reasonably, a hyper hatch with a saloon variant too, the facelifted RS3 from the third generation Audi A3. I recently dropped a video reviewing the Mark 7.5 VW Golf R, answering the question as to whether I thought it was a hyper hatch or not, and one of the main comparison cars was this, as VW Group's leading hyper hatch offering, which absolutely wipes the floor with the R from standard. That's in part thanks to its 2.5 litre turbo charged in 95 engine which sounds incredible and puts out 394 brake horsepower taking it to 60 in four seconds half a second faster than the r8 imagine pulling up next to an r8 and violating it in a hatchback it's crazy where hot hatches have gotten to these days it was the 2016 model year that brought with it the new facelift which continued audi's trend of going from more flowing lines to sharper more angular ones that's why the front end of these is just so aggressive when compared with the pre-facelift and they hold different level to the previous generation. The Sportback is an interesting shape, yes it's a hatchback but the five doors also make it look a little bit like a baby estate but if I was personally looking at getting one it would be the saloon which is definitely less practical but properly good looking still. To get into one you need to spend around 20k at the bottom end making this the cheapest car on the list and for our 35k limit you'll be getting yourself a 2019 example with 25,000 miles on the clock making it the newest car on the list too. Fuel pumps, top mount and the MAF sensor are main issues issues with these but a lot of complaints have also been made around the infotainment system messing up. The first generation Audi RS5 is highly underrated in my opinion as a properly beastie V8 that was meant to take on the BMW M3 and Mercedes C63 AMG. This is probably in part because Audi relied on the beautiful looks of the standard A5 and the extra performance to make a car that was desirable, but it ended up effectively becoming a bit of a sleeper in my books. So with the second gen RS5 there is no doubt in that it's supposed to be an incredibly fast coupe with some of the most flary looks in the RS lineup and a whole different powertrain. 
powertrain, a 2.9 litre twin turbocharged V6 engine that makes 443 brake horsepower, taking it to 60 in 3.8 seconds, which is almost 7 tenths of a second faster despite the smaller engine. That engine is also found in the Panamera 4S, and though the car aesthetically is much larger than its predecessor, it's actually 60 kilograms lighter, a pretty major weight loss in part thanks to that smaller engine. Like the RS3, it also comes with a different spec to the normal coupe, a Sportback, which adds two extra doors and to my eyes at least, effectively looks like a baby RS7, which is pretty cool. In this case though, I'd probably stick to the original RS5 as honestly I think it might be among my favourite looking modern RS cars. The problem with this car though is that its competitors, the newer M4 and C63, are both generally considered to be slightly more performant than it. The M4 revs further and the AMG gains a nice V8 over the RS5's V6. There are also some complaints about the interior having some plasticky parts that are taken from the VW parts bin, like the shift paddles that are taken, I think, from the Golf R. These are only around £29,000 the bottom end nowadays, and for 35k we will be looking at a 2017 model with 50,000 miles on the clock. Rocker arms causing issues early doors were probably the main catastrophic issue with these, often requiring effectively a new engine, and as many of these are now out of warranty, it's something to be very aware of. So I hope you guys are enjoying this video. If you have, then do hit the like button and subscribe as well if you're new. And let me know in the comments down below, what is your personal favorite ever Audi? Mine's very simple. It's the Quattro S1 E2, the Group B rally car, lovely looking car. Love to hear yours in the comments below. I think in the world of Audis, nowadays one name stands above all the rest in terms of desirability, and that's the RS6. Since the first generation's introduction back in 2002, the car has gone from strength to strength, of course carrying on the legacy of the classic RS2 that showed people Audi could make some seriously proper estate cars. I think that the C7 or third generation RS6 is probably the best value for money generation right now, given its quite modern looks, massive power output, and generally in insane performance all captured under that ultra desirable Audi badge, given the RS6 was, for a time, the single most popular car on Instagram. This third gen comes with a 4 litre twin turbocharged V8 that makes 552 brake horsepower, taking it to 60 in 3.8 seconds, so considering it's literally a family estate car, it's the most powerful car on the list, and also almost the quickest, just behind the car taking the top spots. You could actually also get yourself a performance version of the RS6, as if it wasn't already fast enough, which would give you 592 brake horsepower instead, but either way you're getting yourself into a car that was more than £80,000 new for a fraction of the cost. What I think is interesting about these is their competition. It's not just fast estates from other German marks, but the fast SUVs too. The main benefit of going for an RS6 over those SUVs, which is the way the market has been going for some time, is that it's just as practical and actually comes with more interior space, so it ends up being a bit more comfortable to drive. That said, one key complaint with the C7 is that it feels a bit vacant to drive, but I think that probably comes with having that much power. You can't give someone a raw 550 brake horsepower plus family estate and expect them to handle it out on the roads without significant support. These are listed anywhere from around the £24,000 mark, a lot of car for that kind of money, and at 35k you'll be getting yourself into a 2014 model with around 80,000 miles on the clock. The main costs come with fuel, tyres and brakes, with brake warping also being a known issue. Splitting coolant hoses can also wreak havoc, so something to be aware of. This list has been sandwiched between two cars that have just been cancelled at the same time. We started with the R8 and now we're on the TT, specifically the RS from the third gen TT. Let's cut to the chase with this one, it's absolutely rapid. It shares the RS3's lovely 2.5 litre turbocharged inline 5 engine, making 394 brake horsepower as well, but getting to 60 in a list topping time of 3.6 seconds, pretty insane, and it's actually been proven to do 3.4 seconds seconds by third parties. It picked up where the Mark II TTRS left off as a super fast middle ground between the R8 and less sporty TT versions, but with a greater focus this time on being a performance car where the second gen, which I also love by the way, was often criticised for being a bit too heavy to really challenge cars like the Cayman and Boxster as a handling focused sports car. This third gen is really genuinely crazy quick, just think that it's already 0.8 seconds faster 60 than the older R8 we spoke about, and 
minutes faster on track two. Where the R8 did an eight minutes and one second lap time at the Nürburgring, this TTRS did it in seven minutes, 48 seconds, literally 0.3 seconds slower than the much more track focused Lotus Exige Cup 380. It's also more than 20 seconds faster than the Mark II TTRS. Just to give you that point of comparison around the Nürburgring, Audi really focused on resolving the numbness that people complained about with the Mark II and make this much more aggressive to drive, much more of a sports car and add on the aggressive but minimalist interior in them and you've got a properly nice car. It really is a shame that the TT has come to the end of its life but genuinely in my opinion it bows out well and though I reckon the RS is pretty underrated, in time I think more and more people will start to cotton on and reliability wise is a similar story to the RS3 of course. These start at around £29,000 and 35k will get you a 2018 mode with around 50,000 miles on the clock. And there you have it, 5 great Audis for the money, huge thanks to you and the patrons for watching but now you should probably go check out these 5 depreciated BMWs instead.